last week we looked at John chapter um, 14 and that statement by Jesus, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Um, the first statement is, is more of like a global thing. God, Christ gives his peace to the world through the salvation he provided. Uh, the peace that he gives is, is in a sense pers- a personal invitation to receive his grace through the salvation that he has provided through his life, death, and resurrection. So we're in Romans chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. And we're going to continue to try to cultivate peace in our life through the promise of the forgiveness of sins and also the promise of the resurrection and eternal life. So I'm just going to pray quick and then we'll look at the text and we'll just kind of probably divide it up into three sections. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this text and this time that we can get together and read from your holy word. Lord, I do pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to what you have for us. We thank you that we can gather together, and I just pray that um, you would open up through the power of your Holy Spirit, the true meaning of your holy word. Thank you for this time. I pray that every word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you, guided by your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy word. I thank you and I praise you in Christ's name. And all of God's people said... Amen. All right. So let's look at verses one through four. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And I know that probably everybody's got a different translation, but this is basically what it says in verses one through four. Um, Paul, again, is, is speaking. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so Paul's trying to get our attention and saying that our our identity has changed, our reality as, as, as human beings has changed. He talked in chapters 2 and in chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, Paul says in other portions of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 2, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And I ask this question a lot. I think it's important. (laughs) And I ask my confirmation students, and they're starting to get it. What can a dead person do to save themselves? And the answer is nothing. And that's the picture that that Paul wants to paint because in our own strength and in our own merit, we are, it is impossible for us to be saved. We need intervention. We are dependent upon the grace and mercy of God revealed in Christ Jesus. It's Christ who has paid it all. Salvation is totally and entirely a work of God. And so as salvation happens, whether it begins in baptism and continue in the faith that was given at your baptism, or that conversion comes at a later, later time, our identity has changed. And our new identity in Christ really determines how we look at things. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. Paul's basically saying that even though you're free in Christ Jesus, do we continue in the sinful lifestyles that we might have led before Christ and his answer is, of course, no. And so, um, are all of were all of you? You grew up in Christian homes. Is there is anyone here that converted to Christianity a little bit later on in life, or just all your lives? Which is the best testimony of all, right? Amen. So I I was baptized, and um, I went to church pretty much every weekend with my parents. And um, at the age of eighteen to twenty four, I decided that I didn't want to have anything to do. With Christianity anymore. And so between those six years, uh, I lived a life I was completely ashamed of and did exactly the opposite of what it says here. I continued in sin. And, you know, I did it in a very rebellious way. Uh, But thankfully, God pursued me. And at the age of 24, he got my attention. Um, It was kind of like the prodigal son. Uh, I kind of got to the lowest point that I could possibly get. And then God revived the faith that was given in my baptism, and I was restored. So even though, and, and, and you know, there's varying degrees. Some would say that I lost my salvation. Some would say that it went dormant because I walked away. I don't really honestly know. I just know that I didn't really pursue God, and I didn't, I ran as far and as fast away from him as possible, and I also know that he pursued me. 
And that's the loving God that we serve. However, there's this responsibility in this great gift. And so the only way to really see the extravagance of God's grace is to start to really see the extent of our sin. And so we're going to do a little math. <laughs> I hope that's okay. And does anyone have a phone that has a calculator? A phone with a calculator? Yeah. Can you do a little math for me? No, because I don't know how many. <laughs> <laughs> it's just simple multiplication. It's just for a long second. No, I, I don't hmm. know how to do it. All right, I'll... Uh, I'll... I know how to say hello. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. So, so if we use the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments uh, are, are mirror to us to reveal God's righteousness and in turn reveal our sinfulness. For the believer who's been set free from the legal demands of the law, sometimes we don't really understand the magnitude of what we did. So I said this last week, I do a, a Bible study at SDSU with, with a bunch of athletes on Monday night, and I love that. So we started to do this math, and all of a sudden they all looked at me and said, holy cow, you know, <laughs> when you start to think of it. So let's just say, unintentionally, and maybe some intentionally, we sin 50 times a day, all right? I think that might be light, quite frankly, <laughs> but you never know. Come on in. Um, we're going to do some math, even though we're in a Bible study. <laughs> so let's just say, for just for the sake of discussion, and we're in Romans 6, by the way, um, that we sin 50 times a day. Okay, times that by 365. And I can pull up my calculator and do it. Actually, you have your phone. Do you have a calculator on your phone? Yeah. You do some math for me? Say 50 times 365. And what's that number? Okay, 18,250. Now let's times that by 80 years and some... Um, let's say we're going to live 80 years. What's that number? 1,460,000. Okay, now let's think about God's justice. Say we're in God's divine court of law. We have standing against us with its legal demands 1,460,000 accusations of breaking God's law. What if we were only um, penalized one year for each sin? Can we pay that penalty? I, I, and the answer is no. But And the other thing that we have to understand is that one of those sins, so we've got 1,459,000 that's part of just <coughs> our sinful nature, but then there's one sin that sent God's one and only son to the cross. And since we all have intentionally sinned at least once, it was our sin that sent him there, and we've committed premeditated murder. So if you know anything about the legal system, this is a debt we cannot pay. This is the parable of the wicked servant found in Matthew chapter 18, where he was forgiven a debt that he could not pay, and that's you and me. And so this is what Paul means by we are dead in our trespasses and sins. There is absolutely no way that we can be saved apart from Christ. And so one million, and then think about what Jesus took on. 1,460,000 sins for one person, and then he paid for the sin of the world? No wonder he was sweating droplets of blood. The pressure that he must have felt in the Garden of Gethsemane must have been just absolutely overwhelming, and, and I can't even imagine that. And so in chapter 6 of the book of Romans that we're in, and as we look at verses 1 through 4, we have a new identity now. Those legal demands that the Ten Commandments reveal that we have committed are now nailed to the cross, and Christ has openly disarmed them because we have been buried with Christ in his baptism. So just to read one through four again, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And it's the newness of life that I'm trying to get us to see. That penalty is pretty 
pretty ex extensive, isn't it? If you think about it that way. Again, there's no way we can pay that. And Christ willingly took that on for you and for me so that we could be freed from the legal demands of the law. That's extremely important. Now, there's this aspect that we're going to go to in, in verses 5 through 8 here where we talk about our freedom. So for a moment, we're going to go on a little journey. Can we just go to chapter 7 for just a little bit and look at verses 1 and 2? Because this kind of is the point that Paul is trying to make in the verses in the previous chapter in our next section. In verse 1, it says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. That's why our, our baptism and our, our uh, un, united in Christ's death is so important. So say I, I hope this never happens and I'm, I don't think I would ever do this, but say I murdered somebody, <laughs> you know, and then I went to, went to the court and I was found guilty and I was sentenced to life in prison. That sentence or that, that, that judgment would end upon my death, Right? That's the point. As we have been baptized into Christ, we also have been baptized into his death, meaning that the law and the legal demands, the 1,460,000 accusations of wrong are wiped clean because we have been buried with Christ's death and baptism. Does that make sense? So there's a legal aspect. So as we are saved in Christ Jesus, are we, as we continue in the faith of our baptism, all of those accusations have been totally and entirely wiped away, and you and I have received the judgment by God because of Christ of not guilty. And I'm just like, whew. <laughs> if you think about that, that's, that's pretty amazing. And if we can understand the extent of that, and it was so cool to see these kids get this. And I remember this young lady, she looked at me, she's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I'm like, that's the right response. But there's no way that we can see the extent or the hugeness of God's grace without looking at the extent of our sin. It's not possible. It's, it's just not. When you look at a mountain, it's, it's really interesting. As you drive to the mountains, they don't really look that high as you're driving to them. But then you start driving up them or even maybe climbing up a large hill. And I'm telling you, by the time you get to the top, you're like, wow, it's a lot higher than I thought it was. And so that's the beauty of embracing this life of confession and repentance. But we have a new perspective. What shall we say about these things? Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, because we have the newness of life that it says in verse 4. And so we're back in chapter 6 again. And so we have a new identity, and Christ and his salvation determines that identity. Okay? So that's what he's talking about. So he continues to unpack this truth that we have been buried with Christ in his death through baptism. Verse 5, it says this. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to it. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. And that's the point, verse 7. Does that make sense? So those 1,460,000 accusations of wrong all were wiped away as we were united in Christ's death on the cross and that sentence of eternal damnation was taken away and you were given and extended the declaration of not guilty. You've been given full freedom and the promise of eternal life. <coughs> That's a pretty good exchange. <laughs> it's like trading in a really old car and getting like a $200,000 car for nothing. I mean, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. We gave Christ all of our sin and all of our um, condemnation, and Christ took that on himself, and he exchanged that and gave us freedom and his peace. That's an extraordinary thing. And so a lot of times, and it's funny because no matter how you know, long I live and where I travel, there's always a sense where a Christian adopts what I call karma. Karma. 
And then what I mean by that is this, is that we have this idea in our head that if my good outweighs my bad, um, I'll go to heaven. That just simply is not true. That's not Christianity. Our good will never outweigh our bad, ever. Our even It says in Isaiah that our most righteous deeds are like filthy rags before a perfect and holy God. And that's why Paul keeps saying, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And what can a dead person do to save themselves? And the answer is nothing. But here, if we, if we understand that we were hopelessly lost, that we were dead in our trespasses, and Christ, through his salvation, has raised us from the dead, wiped away all of these legal demands that's talked about in the book of Romans, has set us free and given us that freedom as a free gift because God loves us, I think when we start to really examine these things, it starts to birth like a thankfulness and a gratitude in our heart. And this is that peace that Christ has left us and offers to us through his salvation. Does this, does this make sense? We're starting to kind of get the picture here. And so it's a bit technical, but just as we are united in Christ's life, death, and resurrection, that sentence of condemnation is totally, entirely wiped away. And if we look just a couple chapters after chapter 6 and chapter 8, Paul says this in, in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because we have died to sin because we've been united with Christ's death. And so simply put, through Christ's salvation, we are declared not guilty, set free, and given a new perspective. And that new perspective should always embody or embrace the peace that Christ has left us and that wants, he wants us to take. Now, I think sometimes that's a lot, you know, easier said than done sometimes. Um, my mom is a worrier, <laughs> you know, and I've talked about this with her multiple times. And she's like, how, how do you do that? How do you give something to God and not take it back? And I go, you just have to keep reminding yourself because we do that, don't we? You know, especially maybe with kids. And I know that <laughs> poor, poor, poor mom, she prayed for me very heavily between 18 and 24. And I probably gave her some ulcers, but you know, she prayed for me and she worried and she worried. And, um, and I said, it's not that we aren't concerned about people or we're not concerned about things, but there's a difference be, between being concerned about something and allowing anxiety to overtake us. And unfortunately, and I will say this as graciously as I can, and I say it as a hypocrite because I do it too, that anxiety that we have is a sin because we're not trusting in God. And we just have to keep reminding ourselves of that. He's worthy to be trusted. God promised all throughout the Old Testament that these things would happen. And he did it in such a way that it fulfilled his divine law of justice. But he did it in a way where a child can understand, you know, and I think that's really amazing that through Christ and his great sacrifice and us being united with his death and then raised to new life just as he was, we have been given the promise of eternal life. And so our freedom in Christ sets us free from fear. It, and it, it, it sets us free from fear, the fear of this life and also the fear of death. I remember the first parish I served was just south, south of here in Arlington. And there was this wonderful woman. Her name was Diane Pester. She lived down in Oldham. And she had terminal pancreatic cancer. Um, by the time I got there, it had reached its probably stage five. It was, she didn't have much time. Uh, they really had tried everything they could. And she just basically said, I'm done. And I'm just going to let it run its course. And I don't think I've ever met a more brave and courageous person in my life. And I always thought that I was going to her to try to comfort her through scripture, but I always felt like I was the one who got encouraged. Her, 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 her brave spirit, her trust in Christ was unbelievable. And here's this tiny woman who, if you were to take her faith and trust in God and, and, and put it against mine, she would have wiped the floor with me because she had such a faith in God and an understanding that no matter what this world brought to her, there was the promise of the resurrection of eternal life. And she had a peace that I've never seen before because I really hadn't been exposed to death 
as I am as a pastor now. You know, I mean, unfortunately, that's part of my job, but it's also a privilege to walk through believers on those end days. And I was with her on her last day, and she died in a way that I want to, just courageously and trusting in God. And she knew, she knew what was on the other side of this life. Um, my father-in-law, same way. He ended up having, I think, is it non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the bad one? Is that the really bad one? I think that is, it's the bad one of those two. And it took this very athletic and, um, and strong man and, and just whittled him down to nothing. But even in his last breaths, he asked his, his wife and his oldest daughter to sit him up and he, he asked him to, to raise his hands and he died literally praising the Lord. That's, that's what I want. And the only way to have that is to understand, number one, the magnitude in which we have been set free from, to see the extent of God's grace so that we can really begin to understand how powerful that salvation is. And so when we get to some of these detailed aspects of theology, it may seem overwhelming, but the whole point is honestly to be overwhelmed a little bit and to see the great extent that God has gone through in order that you can have his peace and he can take our our death and our condemnation away from us. And that's a pretty good deal. It's kind of too good of a deal to pass up. You know what I mean? So that's the picture that, he's, that Paul is trying to, point, to paint. And so verse seven is the key. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And so now that we have been declared not guilty of sin, now he's encouraging us to not live in it. Because we have been set free, do we just take advantage of that freedom? So let's go back to my analogy. So say I did commit murder, and there was a technical, I totally did it. I, I was guilty. But because the, they did something procedurally incorrect, I was set free. Now, I have a choice but to do something with that freedom, don't I? I can go back to uh, my evil ways. I can go back to my murderous ways. Or I can see this as a second chance and live the life I wish I could have lived, knowing that I really belong to be, I really belong in prison. Does that make sense? And so that's all of us. And so we know that we should really, honestly, be condemned eternally. Um, does it, anyone, would, anyone be willing to read chapter 6, verse 23? And Paul reminds us of that in that same chapter. So verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in, Je in Christ Jesus our Lord. So wages are earned, correct? When you go to a job, you have wages and you've earned it. Now we added up our sin, hypothetically, 1,460,000 accusations of wrong. Do we deserve condemnation? Have we earned that? And we confess this. We deserve your, remember those old confessions from, I think it's the Green Hymnal and, and older one. Uh, we deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. And we are heartily sorry for them. We would confess that on a regular basis. And that's what that's saying. We deserve this. The wages of sin, we deserve it, is death. But here's the great exchange. But the promise of God is eternal life. And that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. And so we should never be a proud, we should never be proud of our sin. There should always be a godly grief that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. And so this is kind of the point. You've been free. You have a new identity in Christ. Your sentence could have been very dire. You deserve death. However, God has exchanged your condemnation of death for the gift of eternal life and freedom from any condemnation of any sin you will ever commit. And that's amazing. So when we say that, when Jesus says that when the Son has set you free, you are free indeed, it kind of carries a lot of weight when you start thinking about it. And that's why I quote, I even say this to myself because there's days I wake up and I'm like, either, either my sinful flesh gets to me or it's the devil. It's like, you don't deserve to be a pastor, and I don't. <laughs> 
You know, you shouldn't be a pastor because you're such a sinner. And some days I, you know, I am a good sinner because I get, I just get angry at the world or I get angry at things and, and I get selfish. Everyone participates in those things. But then I remind myself, I'm like, no, Christ has set me free. The condemnation that's coming on me either from Satan or from my internal selfish, sinful nature is not true anymore because I have been buried with Christ in baptism. I have a new identity and I'm not going to listen to that voice anymore. And I'm going to allow the peace of Christ to rule in my life. And there's times you just have to remind yourself of that. So in my conversation with my mom, how do you give something to God and not take it back? Through repetition. And I, I, I recommended something to her, and she did it. She, I, I, I said, put some verses on an index card and carry them around with you. And any time you start thinking about that, you read those verses that remind you that you've given this to God. And that God hears your prayer. And I think there's a, there's a beauty in that. I think Psalm, it was Psalm 34, and we can look at that in a minute, is what I gave her. And I love Psalm 34 because it reminds us of the goodness of God and it reminds us of the power of Scripture. So let's just actually go there quick. Let's go to Psalm 34 because this might be a really practical tool. And so she started to read this on a pretty regular basis. Now, this was written in the midst of David being attacked by one of his closest friends. Have you ever been betrayed? <laughs> this, is, this is the birthing of this psalm. So if you feel anxious, worry, or, or even if you feel attacked, whether it's by Satan, by another human being, you know, or maybe even by yourself, this section is for you, Psalm 34. And here's this commitment, and this is what I love about David. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his great name together. So what David is doing is getting his eyes off of himself and onto the, onto the God who saved him. And it's, easy. It's, it's not easy to do that, but that's why we need the word of God. It continues, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And that word all in the Hebrew means all. <laughs> and we need to believe God in that, don't we? And so sometimes we need to remind ourselves of this new identity that we have in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of this new reality of being set free in Christ so that we don't give in to fear, that we don't give in to anxiety, and we don't give in to sin because we have been freed. I love the, how it continues. Those who look at him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Have you ever seen anyone who's just in a great mood and they walk in the room and it's like they're glowing? That's what it's talking about. That you have a peace that surpasses all human understanding. That you have a comfort because of the promises of God and you are trusting God in those promises. And it can be seen in your face. And can I tell you, that preaches a louder sermon than I preach on Sunday morning. The joy that you have because of the promises of God will preach a louder sermon than I could ever preach because you're trusting in him. And Diane taught me that. This wonderful woman from Oldham who died like a soldier in the most courageous way I've ever seen. She had peace and joy. Mark, my father-in-law, with his final breath, he was praising God. And that's how, and, it, and then verse six, and then we'll go back to, to um, Romans. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And then verse seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. These are great promises. And so if you need a section of scripture to remind yourself to cultivate that peace of Christ, to, to remind yourself of the new identity, to remind yourself that you're free in Christ, to remind yourself that we serve a God who keeps his promises, Psalm 34 is for you especially verses one through seven, all right? So there's a practical way that we can do that to remind ourselves of this great new reality that Paul is talking about in our text. So let's go back to Romans chapter six. And again, verse seven is, is, the, is the point that he's making. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And here now he's starting to turn the corner. <clears throat> 
And this is where the real peace comes from, where we know that when we die in this physical life or in this temporary life, that it's not the end, that there's something greater on the other side of this life. <laughs> have, I have a friend who um, had to wear some, uh, some really, really painful braces for quite a while when he was a child. And I totally should have had braces as a kid. But um, as he wore them, he was in pain, I think, for a year. But about as he went forward, you know, I don't know, five or six years when he got all of them off, he had, you know, the most beautiful teeth you could have, you know. And so there's, there's an aspect of pain that's a reality in our life now. And I, I hate it. I don't like it sometimes. I don't like getting sick. I don't like seeing people suffer. I, I don't like when injustice is done toward people. But unfortunately, we live in a sinful and fallen world. And sure, we can be concerned about those things, but they should never overtake our joy. They should never be bigger than our peace of, that we have with Christ. And again, maybe we just need to keep reminding ourselves of that reality. And so verse 9, let's continue. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Amen. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. He died for us. Once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And so here's his point. This is our perspective. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so this means a couple things. What does it mean to know that we're dead to sin? Number one, we're free. The legal demands of the law have been nailed to the cross and we have been set free in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. We have been given a second chance. We're also dead to the consequences of sin, meaning the promise of eternal life in the presence of Christ is ours. And it's as sure as it can be because it's not dependent upon us. It's dependent upon what Christ has done. And he won the victory. And so we are dead to the condemnation that comes through sin and its legal demands. We are dead to the wages of sin is death, right? The fact that we've earned this, that's died. It's gone. It's buried. It's in the ground. But then here it is. This is where we're alive and we're living for God in God's freedom, in Christ's freedom, in all of the grace and, and all of the power of the Holy Spirit that he has given and made available to each of us, this is where we'll start living for God. And so I make this differentiation. I've taught my kids this, and they, they use it all the time, actually. And there's a difference, and it's subtle, but it's really big and it's really important. Why do you go to church? Why do you study God's word? It's not because we have to. If we make it and I have to, we're trying to earn it. It always has to be and I want to because of what Christ has done for me. And it's a difference between having a spouse who wants to get to know you and do things for you because of his love or their love or her love versus having a spouse that's just like, ah, I, don't, I don't care, I don't want to know. I don't want to know who you, I don't want to know you. As we are the bride of Christ, we should do everything we can as that bride to get to know everything we can about the bridegroom who saved us and the freedom he's given to us. And we do this not because we have to, but because in Christ's freedom, we want to because of what he's done for us. It's out of a heart of gratitude and thankfulness, not out of, out of a heart of obligation. There's a difference, you know? <laughs> I, I always saw the obligation part when I asked my kids to clean the room. Oh, you know, they would roll their eyes. And, and that's us sometimes, you know, oh, I got to go to church. Oh, you know, we feel that way sometimes. But I know the older I get, honestly, on Sunday morning, I have no problem popping up because I love going to church. I love being a part of, of praising God in the body of believers and be reminded of God's promises. I love studying God's holy word because I always learn something every single time. I study it, I read it. There's always something. It is inexhaustible. You cannot know everything there is to know about scripture. And that's what I love about it. And so this very end section, verses nine through 11, really that promise of the resurrection is what cultivates the peace in our life. Because we know that for us, and this is an interesting statement, and I'm, I'd love to maybe hear your thoughts on this. This is our hell as believers. 
This is as bad as it gets. And there's a lot of good things about this life, right? But have you ever thought about it that way? For the believer, this is our hell. This is as bad as it gets. It only gets better. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> it is to me. Because <laughs> I, honestly, life is good. I mean, now that I'm in South Dakota, you know. <laughs> I love it out here. I mean, I have to like train my, when I went back to Minnesota, I'm like, oh, I got, I was going into a convenience store just to, to get some caffeine to stay awake. And I'm like, ah, oh, I forgot my mask, you know? And, and I mean, I'll, I'll, I will wear a mask if I need to and out of respect and stuff. But there's sometimes, you're in a store, they got plexiglass up and there's no way. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's nobody in there. And, and I just, I don't know. I love South Dakota. I'll just say that. And I love the open spaces and I love the people. Uh, there's a reasonableness here that just I, I missed so much on the six years that I wasn't here. And so there are a lot of good things in life. I can see my granddaughter tonight, you know, and my little two-year-old granddaughter, and she's so precious. And in a couple of months, we're going to have another grandchild. And so there are really good things in this life. But there are some really yucky things, watching friends get cancer, watching loved ones die and go home to be with the Lord. And all of those things are sad and and watching what's happening to our nation and the, the hatred and the polarization. And I was in North Minneapolis. I was right in the center of it. And I'm telling you, even though all of those things are disheartening, I always reminded myself that, you know what? This is as bad as it gets. It only gets better from here. And no matter what comes my way, I think of people like Diane Pester. I think of people like my father-in-law and how they courageously faced an injustice because they didn't want cancer you know unfortunately it just happens because we live in a sinful and fallen world and that sin has introduced natural catastrophes it has introduced sin into the world and sickness and diseases and having to get shots and <laughs> you know having your joints hurt because of that shot and, and all of those things there are aspects of this life that do cause us pain but if we can always have this perspective that Paul is trying to get us, that we've been, we have, are dead to sin, and those yucky eternal consequences of going to hell are no longer a part of our reality. Our reality is this, is that we've been set free. Christ Jesus' promise is secure, and the promise of the resurrection is yours, and it's just as tangible as the table in front of you. It is just as real as this room and each person sitting next to you. It is that certain and that real. And if I can be so bold, it's even more real than that. Because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. We serve a risen and living Savior. And everything that we remind ourselves of these promises is why we begin to have peace in our life. And that peace and that joy that's rooted in Christ's victory preaches the loudest sermon because I don't know about you, but this world needs hope now more than ever. And if you can bring hope through your smile, through your peace, and through the courage of facing the difficult things of life, it's amazing how many people will come to you and say, why are you so calm in the midst of this? How can you be so happy? And it's amazing how many, how many doors Christ will open just because you're, you have his peace as a part of your life. Your face is radiant as we looked at. In Psalm 34, there's a difference. All right. I know I went a little long, sorry. But um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, there's a lot there, but it's, it's, it's really good to, to be encouraged by those things. All right? Well, let me pray for us and we'll get going. Lord, thank you for this text. Lord, I thank you that you have set us free, free through your salvation. We thank you that the legal demands of the law no longer have any part to play in this new reality that we have in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. We thank you for all that you went through. Lord, I do pray that we would never take it for granted. Help us to live in your peace. Help us to receive the peace you have extended to us because of your salvation. And may the promise of eternal life and the resurrection always inspire us to live for you in a way that honors you and preaches the gospel with and without words. May we do this in the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen.